Hi. We're going to continue reading The Devil's Pulpit. We just finished the introduction, so this will be the, um, the next uh, section. Uh, the next section is the sketch of Reverend Taylor's life, and then we'll go into the actual book. Let's take a peek at the introduction. So the life of Taylor is going to be um, maybe about four pages, so it shouldn't be too long. Let's just look at that background information they want to give us so we can be true to the story. I'm just uh, turning the page here. Wait a minute, what page are we on? Okay, wait. Let's scooch back. Um, maybe I should download this because it's kind of hard to navigate. Okay, we just finished this. Okay, sketch. Let's make this bigger. And I'm going to move it over this way. I'm actually on archive.org. The link is below the video. If you want to download it or read it there. Okay, so the life of... Reverend Robert Teller, who's the author of the uh, following Devil's Pulpit, and by the way, the Devil's Pulpit is a place in Scotland as well. It's an actual location of a landform. Um, there's various reasons for that name, so let's uh, go ahead. This gentleman was born August 18th, 1784 at Edmonton, near London and educated as a surgeon under Sir Astley Cooper. But as he exhibited a strong religious feeling and great powers of oratory, he was persuaded by his friend, the Reverend Thomas Cotterell, to take a holy orders in the established Church of England, which he did by matriculating in St. John's College, Cambridge, and became a zealous evangelical preacher, at first in London and afterwards in Surrey. Mr. Taylor was religious but candid, and a free inquirer, a tradesman in Mid Midhurst, by the loan of books and conversation, first awakened his skepticism, and as he was too honest to conceal the truth, he drew the attention of the Bishop of Chester, Chester, excuse me, who not only but remonstrated with Mr. Taylor, but persecuted him by depriving him of his support and recommending retirement. Mr. Taylor made several efforts to reconcile to the church, <clears throat> but he was treated with great severity till at length, resistance, resisting the oppression, he joined some gentlemen in forming the Society of Universal Benevolence, of which he became the lecturer in a small theater in Dublin, for which he was driven by, pe by Protestant zeal. In 1824, he arrived in London. He lectured and debated in various places and established the Christian evidence, <clears throat> actually it's only two pages, excuse me, All right. society, some of these discourses were printed, The Lion, published by Carlyle, others form the volume known as The Devil's Pulpit, a name given from the circumstance of the author having been dubbed The Devil's chaplain by Mr. H. Hunt. In 1827, the mayor of London, presumed to be instigated by others, had Mr. Taylor arrested for blasphemy, selecting the matter from the devil's pulpit. This was done in the meanest possible manner, the arrest being made so late on Sunday night as to prevent bail being obtained, oh, Saturday night, excuse me. Let me make this a little larger, okay, so you can read along. Hold on. I'm just going to scooch this over a bit. 
and let's uh, let's see this again. Okay, so basically, let's get back to where we were. Okay. Um, had Mr. Taylor arrested for blasphemy, selecting the matter from the devil's pulpit. This was done in the meanest possible manner. The arrest being made so late on Saturday night. as to prevent bail being obtained, and thereby the man of power gaining the petty advantage of disappointing the public by preventing Mr. Taylor's lecture on Sunday. A persecution was now organized. Wright, a Bristol Quaker and banker, took this opportunity to press a debt and threw the orator into prison. During the same year, a second indictment was preferred, including several of Mr. Taylor's friends, but they were never brought to trial. In October 24, 1827, Mr. Taylor was convicted on one of these indictments by an English church and king jury and sent to Oakham Gall for one year with securities for good behavior for five years. In this Gall, Mr. Taylor wrote the diegesis and his syntagma. This letter was a reply to Reverend John Pye Smith. It furnishes the proofs of arguments used in debates at the Christian Evidence Society. Mr. Taylor also published a weekly letter in the Lion. On Mr. Taylor's release, he formed an intimate acquaintance with Mr. Carlyle. He resumed his lectures with Mr. Carlyle, made a tour visiting the universities, large towns and cities in England, and everywhere challenging the clergy to meet them in argument. A few debates took place, but everywhere an excitement was created and tourists were triumphed. On Mr. Taylor's return from this tour, the rotunda was opened with tremendous effect. A second prosecution followed, terminated by Mis in Mr. Taylor's being sent to Horsemonger Skull, where his treatment was as cruel. So here it is, they're suppressing the knowledge and information he's sharing. They're throwing him in jail on other charges because they don't want the truth coming out. As an English government and faction durst make it, Mr. Taylor, in a fit of desperation from ill usage, having threatened the life of the Galar. And by the way, Galley uh, is where they, there's a, a, there's a uh, play on the words here with the Galar. Uh, so hopefully uh, they won't have him put to death or anything. This fact was made use of even by the government for prolonging his imprisonment during his persecution the society was partly broken up so they broke up these people that were saying things that went against the Church of England uh, and said hey the Church of England is not right this is another interpretation of the Bible this is another interpretation of the scriptures and he was dubbed the devil uh, for interpreting the scriptures this way based on research that he did and um, so during the, his persecution the society was partly broken up so they're trying to stop them they're trying to censor them this is going on in the late 1800s and soon after his release a want of unanimity between unanimity between him and Mr. Carla 
injured his exertions and his public career was terminated by a marriage with a lady of some property with whom he retired to France and there spent in tranquility the remainder of his days and where he died a few years after at a good old age leaving no manuscripts as far as is known so basically they're saying that um, this guy was uh, well okay so let's read his devil's pulpit now and um, I'm gonna make it a little whoops I'm gonna make it a little larger and then we can see it a little better okay this is the first the very beginning the devil's pulpit and a bonny pulpit it is the star of Bethlehem a sermon preached by His Highness Chaplain the Reverend Robert Tower at the Rotunda Blackfriars Road November 7 1830 by the way this time in history uh, was one of the great awakenings in history uh, there was a couple of what they call great awakenings which were religious revivals and new ways of thinking it, they were called periods of enlightenment in history. Uh, let me just scooch this down a bit. Okay, there we go. Where is he that is born King of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Matthew 2 Two. Who are the inquirers, the wise men of the East? Very well. Show them in here, and we will show these wise men of the East, this mighty king of the Jews, the newborn omnipotence, the little baby God. Hark, the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king, peace on earth, and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled, joyful all ye nations rise, joy the trump triumph of the skies, with the angelic host pro proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. And these wise men were come from the east to worship him. I only beg leave to think. I see them at it. I only ask. I'm going to have to download this. Because when I'm navigating, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to read. Okay. Page two. To be permitted to imagine that such a scene really occurred and imagine what your impressions as well as mine would have been had we been specters of it if such a scene really occurred on earth like every other real occurrence it must admit of being imagined to have occurred and even they who require us to surrender our reason should at least leave us the exercise of our imagination so that we may have some part of our minds left and not be out of our minds out and out for it is rather riding us hard of our Christian divines to require us to believe that as true which themselves do not only not know to be true, but dare not trust themselves or anybody else so much as to imagine to be true. The mind's recursive faculty is found to be as great a rebel against faith as its reason. To be a Christian indeed, you must lay aside the use of your minds altogether. 
For the facts of the gospel are of such a mysterious nature that they will not merely not bear to be reasoned on, but they will not bear to be thought on. You may believe that it is true. You may make believe that it is true. You may say that it is true. You may swear that it is true. But the moment you begin to think that it is true, you will find yourself within a, an inch of thinking that it is false. So that there is really no other way of believing the gospel than that in which the Archbishop of Dublin believes the 39 articles. That is taking them in the lump, and so believing without thinking. The sanctity of the seriousness, the charm are gone. The moment you begin to let in daylight on the gospel theater, by imagining that its personages had a real existence, and its incidents a historical occurrence. Who are these wise men? come from the east to say their prayers to a little squalling god almighty sucking his thumb as fast as he could suck and when they were come into the house they saw the young child with mary his mama but it does not say what mary his mama was doing to the young child but it says that the wise men fell down. And then again, it does not say what it was that knocked them down. Only it immediately, hang on, go to the next page here. Informs us that they bought out some frankincense, which could be of no other use than to sweeten the apartment, the stable, I should say. For we are never to forget that our blessed Savior was born in a stable. As the angels told the shepherds, the heavenly babe you there shall find to human view displayed all meanly wrapped in dirty rags and in a ma manger laid. Indeed, one would be utterly at a loss to guess in what the wisdom of the wise men consisted, unless it had been that they had anticipated that the heavenly babe might have such a heavenly smell <laughs> about him this would have rendered a little frankincense or aromatic vinegar very refreshing. And they worshipped him. The wise men worshipped him. What sort of worship wise men would be likely to pay a newborn child? Might be easier guessed at than told. Only it was not very wise of them to open their treasures and present unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, when a hepoth of lollipop or some bull's eyes and sugar plums would have suited his royal highness so much better, and have been quite sufficient to have ensured their own everlasting salvation. But somehow or other, the wise men have always contrived it that salvation should never be cheap. And however little of the prophet may go to the God, God help him, his viscerants and ministers take pretty good care that if you want to go worshiping, you must open your treasures. 
and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return unto Herod, they departed into their own country another way. However, these wise men found their way back to Bethlehem. It is admitted that they dreamed their way back again. But sure, they could never have dreamed that the king of Jews, who ought to have been born in a palace, should be so superfluous in his humility as to suffer himself to be born in a stable. And thus, while he was taking upon... Oops, wrong. I think I'm going to download this book. I don't have much memory left on my computer. Okay, here we go. Himself the nature of man, rendering it very doubtful whether he was not at the same time going to take himself the nature of a horse. For this good cr Christians who believe that our blessed Savior was both God and man, can have no right to quarrel with me for carrying my faith a little bit further than theirs and believing, as I most sincerely do, that he was both man and horse. <laughs> of course, this guy's got a sense of humor. To which most truth faith I am led, not merely by the most natural suspicion attaching to circumstance of his having been born in a stable, as where else should a horse be born? But not to make any sort of play on words or to strain any phrase, whatever from its obvious sense, which I would not, for the world, not to build on the certainty of the fact that he, no human father, than that the angel spoke of him to the mare or Mary his mother, not as the holy babe or holy child, but as the holy thing that should be born of her. I appeal to the whole angelic chorus, to the multitude of the heavenly host, who appeared to these shepherds, keeping watch over their flock by night, in ratification of the express definition than which no words can be more express. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, and this shall be a sign. Now the key of the whole mystery lies in the single phrase. By the way, I cannot read this. It's written in Greek, I believe. And this to you shall be a sign. That is, this Savior, which is Christ the Lord, shall be a sign. The false punctuation of our English Testaments contrived as much as possible to lead the people in error and keep them in it would make it seem that the sign had meant no more than a signal or token that the angel's testimony was correct and that the token was that they should find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger than which a dog in the manger might have known better. For not so ordinary and indifferent a circumstance as a frail young woman running away from her home, as she might have reason enough to do, and being brought to bed in the best lodging that could be hired, for nothing was the sign, which would have been a sign of nothing else than the young woman had not been so prudent as she ought to have been. But Christ himself the Savior, which is Christ the Lord, was the sign, and the sign was to be seen in the city of David. So that's the Greek word. I don't know how to read Greek, so I'm assuming the translation is correct. Now, there are but 12 signs in the city of David, 
twelve signs in the city of David. If among them you will look for the sign of the month November, the season upon which we are now entering, you will find that the sign actually is Sagittarius with his bow and arrow uniting the two natures in his own person. That it is not the two natures of God and man, but the two natures of man and horse, being down on the loins, a human form, but all the rest a horse. So the creed of Saint Athias see us ought to have run that as the reasonable soul and fresh flesh is one man so man and horse is one Christ perfect man and perfect horse of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and it is precisely when the Sun is coming down from heaven that he appears in the sign of a man and a horse and was born in a stable which gives us the true and astronomical explication where I defy the wit of a of man to give any other explication of where I defy the wit of man to give any other explication of the prophecy of Simon in the second of Luke. Apologies, I, I was thinking it should say explanation, but it, it's explication. So, sorry. Behold, this child. Child, says our fraudulent English translation, but a devil's word about a child. Is there in the original or anything half so childish? But this it is. So he's he's writing the Greek here, so he can read Greek. And uh, I can't read Greek, so I can't tell you what it says. I'm trusting he's interpreted correctly. Anybody who can read Greek, let me know. Behold this that is thingamabob, this half man, half horse, this Sagittarius, is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against, another word in Greek, that is, he shall be one of the adverse signs, one of the signs of the winter months, the sign of the month of November, when many in Israel that is, the many stars that make up his constellations sink below the horizon and do not rise again, nor appear in the holy city, till after his resurrection, that is, after the sun, having passed through the humiliation of his wintry state in November, December, January, and February, appears as the Lamb of God, crossing the line of the equator in March where having overcome the sharpness of death he opens the kingdom of heaven to all believers thus giving us the meaning again where no other meaning can be imagined of those words so saint matthew that the earth did quake and the rocks rent and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many the again another greek word the saints in the proper significancy of that word never having meant any persons that ever existed upon earth but referring only to the stars of heaven or the holy ones of God as the holy city the city of David the city of our God and Jerusalem in which all these fallings and risings again these crucifixions resurrections ascensions 
than which no language of astronomy could possibly be more astronomical. Do all of them annually occur? Was no Jerusalem, no city, no place on earth but Jerusalem which is above? As the Apostle expressly admonishes us in these words to the Colossians, set your affections on things above, not things on earth. That is, set your understanding and apprehension on the great principles of astronomical science. And do not be so stupid as to suppose that Jesus Christ and his apostles were persons that ever existed upon the earth. And as, a, as again to the Philippians, chapters 3, 5, 20. Again, this is written in Greek. For our conversations, it is in heavens. That is most explicitly this whole affair of which we speak and preach which is called gospel, has no reference at all to any persons that ever existed or events that ever occurred upon earth. But it is astronomical. It is all to be seen. It is all ex exhibited in, in the visible heavens. As the great Albertus had expressly said, all the mysteries of the Incarnation of our Savior Christ and the circumstances of his marvelous life from his conception to his ascension are to be traced out in the constellation and are figured in the stars and there in the heavenly Jerusalem and only there are Bethlehem the house of bread scooch this over that is the tent of the Virgin of August Virgo in which Christ is conceived and all Beth Sadas Bethany's Beth Shemesh's and Bethel's in which every one of the imagined events of your gospel not excepting one have their astronomical significancy, and which, escaping the discernment of vulgar and uncurious ignorance, have been stupidly mistaken for historical facts, just as a fool who has but seen the diagrams and delineations in the elements of Euclid, will make himself dead sure that all the mathematics in the world could have consisted in nothing more than in making hobscotches and cattle, cat gallows and scratch cradles to play at tic-tac-tic-tac-toe with. I thought it was tic-tac-toe. While our Christian clergy of the present day, either most ignorant or the most deceitful, of the whole human race, have played into this fool's game, have pandered to the passions of barbarous ignorance, and found that swinish multitude would be quite as well satisfied with the shells and husks of science as the colonel. And so the tale was but bloody enough and monstrous enough impossible to have happened and inconceivable to be conceived, they would never endanger the power of the clergy by seeking to be wise above what is written. Thus the clergy have laid the bars of fraudulently pretended historical evidence across the path of knowledge, and I wish those had been the only bars that they had laid. But here, sirs, mind will be of use to you. Here I ask you not as a new, as newborn babes to desire the sincere milk of the word, but I call upon you as full grown men to hold me to the debt of supplying you with the solid intellectual feast of the meaning 
in which I ask no sensible man's assent from his favor, but will challenge it from his conviction. And not a man who hath the intellectual cravings of a man, but shall rise from this feast to tread the fetters of superstition and ignorance under his feet, only to wonder how he could have been held in them so long and to stay with me. How charming is divine philosophy! Not harsh and crabbed as dull fools suppose, but musical as is Apollo's lute, and a perpetual feast of nectared sweets, where no crude surfeit reigns. I've explained to you how the Son, who is the Jesus Christ, and the only Jesus Christ that ever existed, as he passes respectively into each one of the twelve signs of the zodiac, assumes the character of the particular sign, and is assimilated and entirely identified with it, so that while he is still one and the self a same, supreme and only God, we find him continually spoken of under the most opposite and contradictory characteristics and attributes. He is even sometimes spoken of as his own enemy, and is as often the destroyer as the savior of the world, sometimes loving the world, then hating the world, then reconciling the world unto himself, thus borrowing continually his moral character into the gospel fable from his physical affinities in the zodiac. He is the Lamb of God in March. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah in July. While he is the sign that shall be spoken against, that is the sign of Sagittarius, the half-man, half-horse, in the gloomy month of November. The sign which is indeed spoken against, the gloomy month of November. When the people of England hang and drown themselves. And thus, though the whole twelve signs of the zodiac, which I have caused to be sketched on the dome of the minor theater, for the purpose of assisting these illustrations, as such, I should live to see the day when my fortune shall enable me to exhibit the complete theological Iodernian, which I meditate no an iota, not one single genuine passage of your Old or New Testament will I leave unexemplified, undemonstrated, or untraced to its origin in that occult astronomy, which under the allegorical, allegorical veil of what is, was called sacred history has for ages subjugated, insulted reason to the power of priestcraft, and lapsing as unhappily it did out of the management of those who knew its meaning into the ruffian hands of the Goths and Vandals, who knew nothing about it, has muddled the little share of intellect which nature has given them, and maddened them into Christians. It is no longer that doubt is possible, or that conviction can be withheld. When the mind is possessing but the healthy faculties of the mind, shall see what here we are competent to show, that all anomalies, contradictions, absurdities of the gospel, by which a thousand generations of wrangling idiots have been led by the nose, by sanctified knaves, into a thousand different sects, are but the fallen ruins of a once glorious temple, in which art can yet trace out the positions and rel relations of every part, can mortise the beam in the joist, can dovetail every angle, and replace every frieze and cornice upon the and tablature of its probable shaft, 
till the whole shall present to you the perfect symmetry of the first citadel of science. For indeed, and in a sense which Christian stupidity never stumbled on, we say, In jewelry is God known, his name is great in Israel, in Salem is his tabernacle, and his dwelling is Zion. There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield, the sword, and the battle. In the old jewelry, in Cheapside, suppose ye, yes, quite as probably there is in any jewelry upon earth. But look to the jewelry of the zodiac, where the houses of the sun, which constitute the heavenly city, are. And there you will see the arrows of the bow in the hands of Sagittarius, the horse and his rider, which the sun is said to break and conquer by suffering and passing through that sign which is so much spoken against, that through death he might overcome him, which hath the power of death. That is the devil, the diabolus, the adverse sign, Sagittarius of which victory Miriam sang, when the sun rising victorious. There's an asterisk here, and it says the sermons were delivered in this locality, and it says Ed. Somebody's making this note about the old jewelry. So I guess they're talking about in Israel or something. All right, let's get back over the next page here. And we're going to scooch this over. And we're just going to finish this chapter up. Page 10 of The Devil's Pulpit by Reverend Taylor. In the summer months throws the constellation below the horizons so that he seems to be drowned. Sing ye the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. While the psalmist, speaking of the same Lord, that is, the sun, when about, the, when about to enter the sign of the half-man, half-horse, and therefore reconciling it unto himself, tells us in the 147th Psalm that the Lord delighteth not in any man's legs, neither hath he pleasure in the strength of a horse which is as innocent of meaning as the gospel itself. If you will be so innocent as to swallow it as gospel, but clear, harmonious, beautiful, and sublime, in its, its astronomical reference to the sun in Sagittarius, who will you observe is a man only from his head to his hips? so that he has no man's legs to delight in, while all the rest of him is a horse, in whose strength he has no pleasure. The sports of hunting making but little amends to the sun for his humiliation in the short and gloomy days of November, so that our blessed Savior, in becoming what the blessed Simon calls him, the sign that was spoken against, that is the ninth of the twelve signs. Has very strong signs of being a horse, which gave reason enough for the wise men supposing them only to be wise enough to understand his astronomical characteristics when they were inquiring where Christ should be born to make a pretty good guess that he would be born in a stable. And why should the Christian who has no hesitation in calling his blessed Savior a lamb think it profane in us to call him a horse? Of course, there's a talking horse named Ed. <laughs> no, that's a joke. Uh, there's a uh, old TV show called 
the talking horse ed I'll have to find it link it in archive.org probably has that too oh if he only became a lamb that he might bear the sins of the world the whole world it only shows that the sins of the whole world could not have been very heavy but so intolerant so tyrannical overbearing and oppressive has the Christian temper in all ages been that while they represent the Savior in any way they please themselves they raise the cry of profaneness levity and ridicule against the slightest variation of the follies which their own imaginations have consecrated you may look unto Jesus as a bleeding lamb but you may not look unto him as a stock pig. You may address the Holy Ghost as a dove, but you may not call it a tomtit. So the blessed Saint Augustine, being an Orthodox Christian father, the same ornament of the age in which he lived, and the highest authority to us of what the most pure primitive Christianity was, has left us a form of soliloquy addressed to our blessed Savior, in which he shows that our blessed Savior was a black beetle, a cockashaver, or a maybug. That is one of those little insects which Christian children are very properly instructed to stick upon a pin and thread to set them a buzzing that the amiable innocents might learn betimes to think of Jesus Christ and him crucified. So the learned father Athanasius Kirkerish assures us that by the Maybog was signified the only begotten Son of God by whom all things were made and without whom was not anything made that was made. The words of St. Augustine are bonus il scarabus menus nom e tantum de causa quod angentis quod ipsiment sus octa moralium specium endurit sed quo in hoc face nostra seis volvert et ex ipsa nasi homo volarta. He that is Jesus Christ was my good cockchafer, not merely because, like a cockchafer, he was the only begotten, because he created himself and put on a species of mortals, but because he rolled himself in a human excre excrement in other words dung this is from Cecilia de Viter, um page 35 so he's um, referencing a classic it is too execrable for me to translate but god almighty knows that however pure in heart these saints might have been they were men of the nastiest ideas that ever made civiliz civilized life ashamed of them the learned cassilis in quoting so solemn a declaration of the great a saint that jesus christ was a caca sheffer or maybug proves that the saint must have been right from those words of God himself in the 22nd Psalm where he expressly says of himself as for me I am a worm and not a man if you look at the Greek translation where the Hebrew word which has been translated to worm as Hang on. The, 
the great Callias Sphinx should have been translated to a cockashafer. Shall we look that up, cock Schaefer? Let's take a quick look. Now, I'll tell you right now, um, actually, I could probably show you the Talking Horse Ed, too, but let's look up Kaka uh, Schaefer. I'm not sure if I spelled that right. No, that's not it. That is really weird. How does he spell this? Whoops, I got the wrong one. Well, okay, hold on. I've got a couple of pages here. Cock, oh, Schaefer, wait a minute here. It's with a she. Uh, C. Okay, here, let's take a look at this. Okay, this is a cock Schaefer. Excuse me. Okay. Cock Schaefer. I have never seen one of the Cock Schaefer beetles and their larvae. Okay, so it looks kind of like a scarab, actually. <sighs> Alright, guys, I have to look some of this stuff up. I think it's a little bit funny, this uh, book. Because, um, let's see if we can find a video of uh, add the talking horse. If this is going to take me out of here or not. Here it is. Mr. Ed, the talking horse. If you want to see these old movies that are no longer, um, um, you, you can watch this on, um, archive.org. I'm not going to download this or anything right now, but I'll just clip it for a second. Just to give you the idea. Can't hear. Okay. All right, I'll put the link to this below uh, for afterwards, okay, if you want to look at it. And let's get back to our book. Sorry, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent, but I do that sometimes. Because I thought it was, like, really funny, because I when we kept, he kept talking about Jesus, Jesus being um, born in a manger and that the horse was Sagittarius, really, and that they were talking about where the stars in the sky were. At the beginning, when we read the introduction, it was talking about the zodiac and how, as above, so below, and how um, uh, we are sort of supposedly in, in tune with this and we're, we're not supposed to be literally... Uh, reading uh, the scriptures this way, but then, anyway, so this is the devil's pulpit, and we're on page 12, so let me, let me get back to this. But I'm satisfied with the correctness of the received rendering, and do God be praised for so much grace, rest, and in most assured conviction, that our blessed Savior, Savior in that high and sublime sense of science, of divinity, of which our divines of the present day are so egregiously ignorant, really was a worm and not a man, as I prove beyond all possibility of doubt that no such man ever existed, but sprinkle cool patience on your warm feelings, and I will make this matter possess itself of your conviction, with confirmation strong as proof of holy writ, that our blessed Savior was the only God, really was a worm. And actually, when you translate in that Hebrew, he's a scarab, or a beetle, which they call a cock shafer. Okay. So wait, let me scooch back down. Just trying to clarify this. I hope you don't mind me having an annotated uh, rendition of this. Uh, that our blessed Savior and only true God was really a worm. You have, not alone, his own word in that most positive declaration of himself, 
than which no words could be more positive. As for me, I am a worm and not a man. But you have the whole analogy of faith and all the harmonious coincidences of the sacred science to illustrate and events for observe ye our blessed savior achieved his mightiest conquest in the grave and tis in the grave that the worm conquers everybody nobody was ever conquered in the field but the worm <laughs> to the challenge o grave where is thy victory the only answer is the victory is the worms to the worm alone can it be truly said thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory the debt of gratitude however ungrateful must be must at last be paid and as they say our blessed savior died for us we must die for him and as he gave us his flesh to eat we must return the compliment <laughs> and give him ours. We must go to the Lord's Supper, as it is very accurately called the Last Supper, where we shall not be shown up as the company, but served up as the dishes, where we shall be at supper like Paulinus in the tragedy. tragedy as suffer where not where we shall eat but where we shall be eaten that he was a worm and no man is still further illustrated in the text by which saith of him verily thou art a god that hidest thyself and that which saith who hath immortality as he Thrice, scooch this over. There we go. Devil's Public, page 13. Declares himself to be the worm that never dieth. Whatever part of us may go into the fire that shall never be quenched, nothing is more certain than that when we go to Jesus. All the fat and lean will go to the worm that never dieth. Now hold, and I unlock this mystery. The mystery exists only in the misty view of Christian ignorance that our noble science, that like the rock that lifts its awful form, swells from the veil and midway meets the storm through though round its sides the rolling clouds are spread eternal sunshine settles on its head the intolerance of christian ignorance might be readily to exclaim that at this rate we could make anything of jesus christ i certainly proved him to be a horse and now I have proved him to be a worm. <laughs> yes. And if you'll honor me with your attention hereafter, I will prove him to be a fish. And you may not think that I treat the matter lightly. I will prove him to be a pair of scales. And you shall weigh him for yourself. Remembering only, I pray, that a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but the true scales are his delight. In a word, we shall trace the real and only Jesus Christ through every one of the twelve signs of the zodiac to have been nothing more than a, the personified genius of each of those signs that is of the sun as considered in each of them. The same with varying physical phenomenon or phenomena, excuse me, throughout his annual course. As but look, I pray, on any projection of the signs of the zodiac you please, 
immediately before the horse or sensual of November. You shall see the scorpion, black beetle, or worm that never dieth, the genius of October, the first of the winter months, standing there in the gates of hell. That is the point at which the sun dips below the equator, and there sands and worm ampersand C to testify the whole world that this is a long chapter. It's kind of funny. Okay, that fire whose cheering light and heat is now about to be abated and apparently withdrawn, shall yet never be quenched. Upon these ingenious figments, so egregiously misunderstood, and put so madly from their scope and purport hath our clergy contrived to play upon the ignorance of the people, but no single discourse, nor I fear the discourses of a whole winner, will be sufficient to possess you of all the treasures of this delightful science, in which, as you advance, you will see all that is apparently wild, so monstrously confused, and such a jumble of contradictions and absurdities, as to outrage all faculty of method and sobriety in man, like matter and chaos, falling in at the command of a superior genius into the a most superb and beautiful orrery, exhibiting all the great phenomena of nature and solving every problem of this mystic science. We prove to you that Christianity is a fable, with all precision of mathematical demonstration, showing you not only how and in what the fable originated, but what were its meaning and moral. And we work out a quadratic equation by presenting to you the unknown quantity in the defiance of your mind's power of saying nay to it, solving all the difficulties, explicating all the mysteries, reconciling all the seeming contradictions, and answering all the requisitions of the great problem, the key that corresponds to the words, to the words of the lock however complex and intricate those words may be. The key that fits into the lock, the key that actually throws the bolt and opens the door, is the key of the door. That key, with respect to the Christian religion, is its allegorical astronomical sense. With that key, I will return on some future occasion to the question where is he that is born king of the Jews? I will unlock the Augean stable and bring down such a stream of science and true learning upon the congregated filth of barbarous ignorance as shall wash away the manger and the king of the Jews and the Jews and the wise men and all and purify the atmosphere of reason. Now you know why it's called the Devil's Pulpit. It's blasphemous. Throw him in jail. Okay, let me continue page five. From the pest of Christianity, I shall show you that thou, though it may be possible enough for the dunce and the fanatic, the half-idiot, or the three-parts knave, to still continue to take personifications for persons' allegories, for histories, the mere machinery of science for its ultimate scope and end. It is not possible for a man of learning, whose learning has ever taken its fair range, in these investigations not to know that the Christian religion as taught in this Christian country is what I may not call it, craftily practiced by great and mighty knaves, upon the simplicity of ignorance and the impotence of childhood. But here, sirs, with no other presumption than such at, as that of those who in any age of the world have offered truth and science to the world in the place of the jargon, 
of sanctified idiocy and consecrated falsehood as Pythagoras presented his demonstrations of the equality of the square and the hypotenuse uh, to the squares of the sides, the right angle triangle, as Columbus presented his evidence of the existence of the transatlantic continent and as Galileo asserted his science, excuse me, of the Earth's motion in the teeth of the monkish ignorance and priestly cunning incapable of anger as of fear, inviting criticism and challenging the opposition of learning. If there be any learning in the world that can oppose us, we offer you our great solution of the evangelical riddle. It can only confuse you while you are ignorant. It can only offend you while you are dreaming. Awake, and you will find that we were awake before you, and you will come again and again to this true school of intellect and reason to demand and to receive, I trust, not eternal repetitions of a silly story, but to imbibe the mean, mind-invigorating droughts of genuine learning and still increasing knowledge. Here, nature opens all her secret springs, and heaven-born science plumes her eagle wings. Too long hath, hath bigot rage with malice swelled, crushed her strong pinions, and her flight withheld. Whoops. Let's get over to the next page. Oh, and that is it. Oh, wait. No, wait. we got another paragraph. And then we're going to read the next uh, chapter next time. Okay? Thank you for listening. Okay, it's, it's ending with a poem. Too long to check her ardent progress, strove, so rise, the serpent round the bird of Jove, hangs on her flight, restrains her towering wing, twists in its dark folds, and points its venom sting. But breaking thus the spell of things divine, her rising pride shall mock the vain design, shall rise to liberty, to life, to and light, while priest and priestcraft sink to the endless night. The end of the first discourse on the Star of Bethlehem. Thank you for listening. Uh, I shall uh, do this again when I get some more time. And take care.